Israel's launched new attacks in Gaza and the West Bank less than 24 hours after 150 countries voted for a United Nations resolution condemning Israel's military offensive. A new wave of violence hits Gaza and the West Bank city of Kalkilia. Ambulances rushing to the nearest hospital with dozens of Palestinians injured in an operation conducted by Israeli troops. Israeli soldiers had surrounded a house where a Hamas member was thought to be hiding. A crowd of angry Palestinians confronted the soldiers who opened fire. Three Palestinians were killed and more than 30 injured. More than 100 nations may have said stop, but the Israeli action goes on too in Gaza. It all flies in the face of what happened at the United Nations on Thursday. The General Assembly voted well in favor of condemning Israel for the 21 deaths in Beit Hanun and calling on it to stop attacking Gaza. Let's take a look at the vote. It was passed 156 to 7, with the United States, Australia and, of course, Israel voting against it, along with four Pacific Island nations. Six countries abstained from voting, but all European Union members supported it, but only after the text was changed to express sorrow over the shelling instead of condemnation. Now, the resolution also calls for an inquiry into the killings and says it deeply deplores the civilian deaths at Beit Hanun. But the Palestinians did not escape criticism. The resolution also urges them to stop firing Qassam rockets into Israel. My reaction is uh, that it's uh, deja vu all over again. I mean, the General Assembly is a place where any resolution against Israel will get uh, over 100 votes. If the General Assembly voted that Israel won the World Cup, we would probably be declared as the winners, although I don't think it would happen on the field. It's a place of great hypocrisy and double standards. The General Assembly was actually hijacked, abused and misused by a block of countries who are inherently anti-Israel. You're watching the Al Jazeera News Review, which covers the world. To Darfur now and amid conflicting reports of whether UN troops will after all be welcome to keep the peace, reports of new attacks by the Sudanese government and Arab militia, as Haru Mutasa explained. Well, we can confirm that the African Union Force Commander um, in Sudan, Major General Apresi, has told us that the attacks are indeed happening. They're happening in the north in the Bamaza region. He's saying it's a series of aerial bombings and attacks by Arab militia on civilian communities. Now, there are no um, exact figures yet. We don't know how many people have been killed, but he is saying that some people have been caught in this crossfire. They should come from the African continent. Now we have about 8,000 Africans. I don't think it is, it is impossible. It is rather difficult for the African, for 53 Africans, it says, to raise uh, another 8,000. Okay, you're uh, saying it's difficult for them to raise this number. So where are you going to find these numbers in the African continent? You can't say it is impossible, it's straightforward. People should, should consult with each other. The African Union should do some work in this regard so that the number, the, the, the gap will be bridged in the number of the required forces in that fort. Just to pick up on the remarks made there, they were inconclusive. And one of the points made, though, was that a political process has started. The first stage is a political process. So Sudanese diplomacy is kicking into gear, and that sometimes sends out mixed signals. But if, uh, if Chris Mat Matlock could actually pan the camera around, I can give you some idea of the whole layout here, because it actually defines the complex situation on the ground in Darfur. You're looking on the skyline of the Jabal Mara Mountains. Now, just there, you have the SLA rebel group that is opposed to the ceasefire. Beyond them, on the Chad border, the National Redemption Front exists. They're vaguely allied to the SLA uh, anti-peace agreement. Now, if you pan to the left, Chris, uh, right across here, you'll see the town of Tuwila. It is, in fact, a ghost town. Everyone fled the place. Uh, the reason was uh, attacks from Arab militia. And the Arab militia are only around 10 kilometers away from here, we're told by sources of the AU. Now, go to the left again, and you see where the people fled to. They came to the nearest 
possible safe point, and that's the AU base in the foreground. So something like 25,000 people are there living in pretty grim conditions. There are no non-government organisations here, no aid agencies. It's too dangerous to travel on the roads. So let's go over now to Haru Matassa. All this wasn't here 10 months ago. It was simply empty space. But as the fight had continued, more and more families came here to be near the African Union base. They hoped the AU would give them some form of protection. But living here hasn't been ideal. There's no water, schools or medicines. And one elder told me that it's become normal for families to lose their children here and that they're angry because most of these deaths could have been prevented had there been a basic health facility nearby. But they're trying to get on with their lives. This is what little food they have here at the moment. And these women over here have spent the whole day in the sun drying what little vegetables they have. They will try to make this last as long as they can. Half a million Somalian children are in desperate need of aid after the worst flooding in the region in 50 years. That's according to one humanitarian organization. Yes, torrential rains have hit parts of Somalia, Kenya and Ethiopia. In fact, the entire Horn of Africa has suffered under the downpour. The Somali town of Baldawane is the worst affected, with the Shabel River threatening to burst its banks. And Kenya's northeastern Dadaab region, which houses many refugees, is also facing crisis. In total, 1.8 million people have been affected by the floods. The extent of the problem in Kenya is uh, complicated because uh, Kenya, northeastern Kenya and also some parts of southern Somalia have been affected by a drought earlier uh, this year and uh, now the problem is that even if it sounds surreal, uh, the same areas are affected by the flood. So we need to help on a daily basis thousands of refugees, Somali refugees in northeastern Kenya. We also need to, to help thousands of pastoralists in northeastern Kenya and at the moment uh, our trucks are stuck on the road. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to, to reach them. Uh, we think, and that's the big fear at the moment, that the situation could worsen uh, because the forecast, the weather forecast is not very good for the next two weeks. Uh, and there is a dam uh, in Kenya uh, which was close to uh, bursting, so they had to open it. And our fear now is that this dam is going to uh, uh, the water of this dam is going to go inside the Tana River and we think that by tomorrow or in about three, four days time uh, this, this river is also going to burst its banks and that is going to cause uh, considerable more damage to the people there. The flood threats and war in the Horn of Africa. This is the news review on Al Jazeera where we look at the major stories of the day and how we covered them. Well, I'm outside the Supreme Court here in Kinshasa, where supporters of Jean-Pierre Bemba, the loser in the presidential race here in Congo, have mounted a legal challenge to the results of the election. Bemba supporters seen here running towards the Supreme Court, a noisy but by Congo standards harmless crowd. This angry man says the vote of the Congolese people has been stolen. Bemba lost the presidential two-horse race by over two and a half million votes. He's never accepted the result, alleging widespread vote rigging, a claim rejected by the Independent Electoral Commission. Now Bemba's lawyers have made their legal challenge. The clerk of the Supreme Court accepting papers today. Yeah, I'm well, this is a legal document submitted by Mr. Bemba's lawyers. It challenges the result of the Congolese election, alleging widespread fraud. So you're just bad losers, aren't you? You're using the legal system to overturn the election. What would you say bad losers, my friend? I mean, that's basic, that's fundamental. You're Democrats. Hardcore supporters have vowed to return to the court every day until the judges vote in their favour. John Cooks and Al Jazeera, Kinshasa. Dozens of protesters have been detained by Greek police following clashes at a rally in the capital of Athens. Police fired tear gas at the demonstrators during the annual event on Friday to mark the anniversary of a student uprising in 1973. At least 10 people were injured. This is the Al Jazeera News Review.